Um, I got emailed this video. Ukraine, the avoidable war. You know, I don't know anything about the content of this video. Maybe, wait, hey, okay. Maybe it's cringe, maybe it's not. Who is this dude? This is Boy Boy. Okay. Alright, well. Why? <laughs> I wasn't. Do you know there's a war? Committing yeah, to the There's bit. a war. There's a war going on in Ukraine. War has returned to Europe. Russian tanks and troops rolled across the border. Russia is facing allegations of war crimes. Escalating towards World War Three here in Ukraine. All this bloodshed and carnage just came out of nowhere. Yeah, this is from April, so this isn't like this wasn't released yesterday. But I want to see. You know, it's maybe, guys. Maybe this video isn't even bad. You know, I, I haven't even seen it. I just want to see. You know, somebody emailed it to me. I said, oh, okay. Yeah. What the hell is that? Putin is a monster. He's unleashed hell in Europe. And the question is, why? You know, why would he do that? Well, if you ask the oldest and wisest man in America, the, the president, he'll tell you that Putin did it for no reason. Putin's latest attack on Ukraine was totally unprovoked. But 25 years ago, this same guy predicted this is exactly what would happen if the US expanded NATO into Eastern Europe. And if there was ever anything that was going to tip the balance were it to be tipped. Oh, no in terms of a vigorous and hostile reaction in Russia. It would be that. So what the hell's NATO? What, what does this all mean? And oh, what no. did Biden know 25 years ago that he doesn't know now? So the best way to get something done, if you, if it holds near and dear to you that you uh, um, like to be able to, anyway. Well, to find out what's going on, we gotta go way back to the Soviet Union in the 90s, back when Russia and Ukraine were part of the same country. Now, there's a lot of nice stuff in the Soviet Union, like oil, gas, coal, and grandparents that look like this, all of which make it the most resource-rich nation in the world. And now that the US won the Cold War, the Americans had- I don't know if it's the most resource-rich in the world, but Ukraine is, like, uniquely resource-rich. That is true. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, I don't think- I, I mean, I don't know if we're going, like, per square mile. I don't- yeah, whatever, whatever. Two options. One was to start a new world of equals without war or exploitation. And the other option was to plunder your old rival and make lots and lots of money. Now, if you want to make lots of money in the Soviet Union, the first thing you need is a really, really drunk dude called Boris. He'll do whatever you say, but the problem is no one likes him. Like, how do you get an unpopular loser like Boris into power? Well, you got to spend money to make money, right? And Boris's friends in the White House slipped him a sneaky $2.5 billion donation, allowing him to monopolize every media outlet and bribe anyone who needed to be bribed. Now, $2.5 billion obviously sounds like... Okay, we're um, streamlining this a lot, it seems. Okay, so... Um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, the, there was an immediate power vacuum that was left in the former Soviet territories, most notably Russia here. Um, where most of, you know, a lot of the state-owned uh, state industry was cut up and distributed amidst a collection of oligarchs, many of whom had power in the previous regime. Um, there wasn't really a good lead-in to a democracy. Uh, Boris Yeltsin was the, like, post-fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, you know, uh, rep. Uh, he was very buddy-buddy with Western officials. He oversaw the introduction of our market principles to Russia and the shock doctrine, which led to a number of problems. Yeltsin was, oh yeah, a very bad leader um, in, in a number of ways. He was dishonest. He was very corrupt. Um, he didn't seem to care that much about the well-being of the Russian people. And that's why he was great for Western interests, because Yeltsin basically just drank and turned a blind eye. Uh, you know, it, it essentially didn't it didn't fight for the well-being of the Russian people as it as we as the West sort of made an effort to integrate economically with the former Soviet bloc, which means, of course, you know that all these integrations were done on our terms. Uh, it's not good, yeah. And yeah, he appointed Putin, and we all know how that went. So yeah, so this guy's not wrong. Um, I, I it's just um. It's just complicated. There's, it's, it's complicated. It's really, really complicated. You know, the, the problem, the problem is like, um, like the West basically tried to like buy out Russia. The West basically just tried to use our wealth and influence to shift post-Soviet Russia in the direction we wanted. And the issue is that's bad. But at the same time, Russia was the most 
push aroundable country at the time. You, like there the the oligarchs that had power within Russia, the former Soviet officials, they did not make an effort to protect their country or represent its interests in a fair way. This is one of the reasons why Putin is so popular today. A common narrative is that Yeltsin and his ilk sold out Russia to the West, and Putin, as a nativist strongman, was willing to fight for the Russian people. And of course, you know, that is dishonest in its own way, but I, I, guess, I guess what I'm saying is that, like, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia was... Russia needed a, a kinder hand than the West has ever applied to a former rival. <laughs> and they didn't get it. Like a lot of money, but the Americans got a lot more in return. You can do pretty much anything now that Boris is in power. Like, even when 77% of the country votes to keep the USSR together, Boris can ignore that and go get drunk with just three dudes. And all he has to do is just open this document. Just, just open it, open it up. Just concentrate a little bit. I'm not familiar with this referendum. Hold on. USSR referendum. What, what did he say? 77%? The official referendum that had been held in Estonia on the 3rd of March, 1991, on whether to restore the Estonian Republic that had been occupied by the Soviet Union in 1940, the result was 77.8% in restoring the Estonian Republic. Th that is not the same thing as what he said, that's a entirely different thing. Um, okay, this is another thing. 76 in Soviet referendum voted to preserve country. More than three quarters of those took place in the um, Sunday's referendum. Oh, this is uh, March 20, 1991. Okay. Future Soviet Union voted in favor of keeping the country together. The head of the referendum commission said Thursday. Final results said 76% of citizens voted for the preservation of the country. As a renewed federation, Vladimir Olov told the Soviet Supreme or National Parliament. Six of the 15 republics boycotted the vote. Oh. Well. If... If six of the 15 republics boycotted the vote, then this is kind of a non-starter, right? I would be curious as to who was allowed to vote in these polls. These weren't exactly democracies. You know, like, this was right after the Soviet Union fell. None of these countries were democracies. I'm a little curious as to, like, who was allowed to vote. But if six of the 15 republics boycotted it, I mean, you can't you can't just, like, force the USSR. I mean, I guess that's what the USSR initially was. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Yeah, also, the in terms of population, the majority of the Soviet Union was Russia. So, if we're talking percentage of citizens, but most of those citizens are for Russia, it's possible that these results really show that Russia just wants to maintain control over its, like, you know... um. It, 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 you know, uh, 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 Warsaw Pact imperialist controlled satellite countries um, and the other countries didn't really want to be controlled. Wiki article in that referendum? Yeah, this is one of those situations where a bit of reflection on... Oh! And there it is! <laughs> That's quite a difference right there. Hold on. You can see the Republic... Okay. The countries that voted like 100% yes down here were all those countries. But Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania um, abstained. Wait, which one? Is this Azerbaijan? Guys, help me. Georgia? Okay, sorry, Georgia. Georgia and... Uh, it's rotated. It's rotated. I wasn't prepared for this. And Moldova? Gotcha. So, one, two, three, four, five. What's the sixth one? So, Moldova, Azerbaijan, um, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Armenia? Is that right here and I just can't see the line? Okay, gotcha. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of an important point, right? Yeah. But even in countries that voted yes in this referendum, they later overwhelmingly supported independence. So, like, yeah, in 1991, the Ukrainian independence referendum, 92.3% supported the Declaration of Independence for Ukraine. So, 
that's in the same year. Both of these are in 1991, one in March and then later in December. So Ukraine went from generally supporting being part of the USSR to overwhelmingly supporting independence. It's interesting. I have a feeling that a lot of this... Wait, when was this referendum held? Was it before or after the wall fell? Wait. When did USSR collapse? I mean that euphemistically, not literally. Okay, there we go. The USSR didn't officially collapse until late 1991, so this referendum on keeping the USSR together was before it fell. The, re the results here were probably dictated more by, um, like, fear of change, preservation of the status quo. But even then, these countries abstained, so, yeah. Okay, sorry, uh, a, bit of a bit of a tangent there, but I'm interested in this. Get, get it open. Yep, yep. And, and once it's open, he can sign it and dissolve the Soviet Union himself. And this is where things got really... Dramatic. Did he actually play that? Dang it's time it. for capitalism, baby. Which meant selling trillions of dollars worth of Russian assets to private companies. Okay selling all these assets to private companies, but a lot of this was... Wait, who are we blaming for this? Um, that, that is what happened. The implication here is that... Hold on. Post-USSR privatization. A lot of these oligarchs were formed pretty quickly. Um, privatization in Russia. Um, during the Soviet Union. Okay, here we go. Uh, voucher. August 1991 coup d'etat. Economic situation drastically worsened. Yeltsin delivered a speech that declared price controls would be lifted in 1992. Privatization took place on a wider scale in the early 1990s when the government of Russia deliberately set a goal to sell its assets to the Russian public. The new government was forced to manage the huge state enterprise sector inherited from the Soviet economy. Um, to distribute property quickly and win over public support, the reformers decided to rely mostly on the mechanism of free voucher privatization, which was earlier implemented in Czechoslovakia. The Russian government believed that the open sale of state-owned assets, as opposed by the voucher program, would have likely resulted in the further concentration of ownership among the Russian mafia and the non clementura which they sought to avoid. Um, nevertheless, contrary to the government's expectations, insiders managed to acquire control over most of the assets, which remain largely dependent on government support for years to come. Okay. Because most people were not well informed about the nature of their program or were very poor, they were quick to sell their vouchers for money. Oh, man. Did they really just split all these vouchers up, like, across the population of starving people? And were like, here, now we collectively own stakes in this former government enterprise. Here you go, fucking former potato farmer. Have this share. Of course they were going to sell it. <sighs> okay. And um so I I I I think a lot of this is our fault and a lot of this isn't. So I don't want to like leftists have a tendency of this American diabolistic attitude where anytime something goes wrong in the world they exclusively focus on what America did. Now the West absolutely made an effort to fuck over Russia with shock doctrine, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's true. Um, however, I think a massive part of the blame here has to be laid, frankly, at the feet of the consequences of the Soviet Union's governmental decision-making. It was an autocratic country that had essentially no functioning democracy and had, like, no real plan for the effective distribution of resources and the, um, the, the, the division of state control amidst the private population. And a lot of these things are really kind of just down to the Soviets not doing a good job nation building, you know? Um, we can't blame everything on, on America here. This was kind of a fucked situation to begin with. And I do, I do believe that even if the West hadn't made an effort to rush in and capitalize on the post-Soviet, um, you know, economy through rapid investment and um, economic austerity and neoliberalization, I still believe there would have been catastrophic economic issues.
Uh, yeah, the Soviets lost the Cold War for pretty evident reasons. Anyway, I just mean to point out that this, I don't think, I, do, I just don't want the narrative here to be the same as, like, what America has done to, like, Latin American democracies that we funded coups over. Like, there are degrees of involvement, and um, the Soviets did not do a great job here. It kind of is, Vosh. No, it's not. But as they were sold off, all these assets wound up in the weirdest places. I mean, take 26-year-old Boris Jordan, for example, uh, an American who worked for the bank Credit Suisse. This kid ended up owning 10% of the shares in Russia's newly privatised companies. Now, how the hell does a 26-year-old end up buying 10% of the world's biggest country? Well, it turns out this kid was shopping at Crazy Boris's Bargain Basement. Now, only 10 very special people were allowed to shop here. Just 10 of Boris's American and Russian friends were now the sole owners of the entire Russian economy. Not only did they get it all basically for free, but they were also- Wait, what? I'm pretty sure the privatization didn't split the economy of Russia up 10% to 10, to 10 people. <sighs> Let me get the name of this person again. Boris Jordan. Russian-American billionaire, hold on. His net worth is 1.6 billion. Hold on. Jordan assisted Russia's economic transition to capitalism in the early 1990s. Yup. Assisted in the launch of the Russian stock market and the privatization of state assets. Um, John worked with Bruce Gardner. Became a leading investment banker. So created the Russian Direct Investment Fund. He's the chairman of Curaleaf, a cannabis company. We've seen it, Dr. Harms owners of the entire Russian economy. Not only did they get it all basically for free, but they were also given a really cool new nickname, Oligarch. Now, th things were obviously amazing for these 10 dudes, but it wasn't quite as good for the remaining 148,317,990 Russians who woke up in a country that had just sold everything it once had. Food, healthcare, wages, all the vital parts of your life that you took for granted yesterday had suddenly evaporated. Now, Boris conducted what numerous historians have called the greatest theft in world history. Hyperinflation hit 2,323% overnight. Everyone's savings were wiped out in a day. If on Tuesday you had 100 rubles in the bank, on Wednesday you've got four. It was complete chaos. I mean, poverty grew faster than anywhere in the world at the time. Life expectancy dropped by 10 years, which has never happened to a country in peacetime. I mean, GDP fell by 50%. To put that into perspective, when Hitler invaded Russia in World War II and killed 26 million... Wade took for granted they didn't really have those things beforehand? Uh, no, no, no. The, the average Russian definitely lost out after the Soviet Union fell. The Soviet Union may have been corrupt and inefficient and a bunch of other bad things, but there were provisions that were offered by the Soviet Union that just stopped existing after the Soviet Union fell. Um, in part due to, well, the collapse, and in part due to the economy being fucked, and in part due to massive privatization, and they all kind of, they all kind of, like, relate to each other. I mean, it all interweaves, but no, nah, this seems fair, yeah. Yeah, shock therapy was pretty cringe. People, GDP only fell by 24%. This is goddamn crazy. I mean, the Americans and the oligarchs made a killing, and the only thing they had to do to, you know, keep the money flowing was just to keep an eye on Boris, and make sure he didn't drunkenly stumble in front of a bus or something. But... It wasn't all smooth sailing, right? Soon enough, the democratically elected Russian parliament realized that Boris had created a humanitarian catastrophe and they barricaded themselves in the building trying to impeach Boris and bring the country back to normal. Now, if you want to resolve this kind of delicate political situation, you need to be subtle. Yeah, as somebody in chat just pointed out, a good example would be like rent costs, for example. Um, Soviet rents were heavily subsidized by the government. A modest two-room apartment would have gone for six to eight rubles, like eight to 11.30 a month, including some utilities. A four-room apartment could be 14 to 16 rubles um, a month. Uh, but then when it privatized and like all those subsidies went down and it's like private landowners, well, now you have to pay like Western rent costs. That's not good. Um, yeah. yeah. Calculated and above all, very, very careful. So Boris got his tank and blew up. Genuine question, not a tanky, but was the collapse of the USSR actually a bad thing if the result was Putin's Russia? I mean, the, the problem is, like, there's, uh, like, we can lay the blame on Russia and on the West here. So, on Russia's side, I'm sorry, they're on the hook for leading a corrupt autocracy that engaged in regular political purges and, like, minority purges for a hundred years, you know? Um, that's on them. I'm sorry. I'm not blaming America for f the fucking stones that Lenin and Stalin, you know, laid down. Um, the problem is, like, after the Soviet Union fell, we, 
I, I guess the simplest thing to say is that, like, the West treated Russia the way we treat, like, third world developing nations, you know? If, if Russia had just been, like, any other weak, like, Cold War era Latin American, uh, you know, like, Great Age of Imperialism, African country, Southeast Asia, whatever, we could have fucked them over, taken as much as we wanted from the population, and nothing would have come from it. And that would have been miserable. That would have been morally wrong. The problem is that Russia has two things. A, a tremendous amount of land. B, a tremendous amount of people. Oh, and three, nukes. They were never going to be able to be like any other situation, and we can't keep our foot in them for that long, because, again, nukes. Um... And they have oil. Yeah, well, I was including that in the land. They're, they're natural resources. We weren't able to really supplant them the way that we do with other losers in the Imperial game. And again, we shouldn't be trying to supplant anyone, but we got kind of a worst case scenario here because what we tried to do was keep them underfoot and all we got was them having a reason to resent us after losing the Cold War. It's like we didn't learn from our lesson with, like, Germany, right? After Germany lost the Second World War, you know, we occupied them, and we genuinely did try to build West Germany up. No such effort was made with Russia. We rushed in there, and we tried our best to exploit uh, every bit of resource that we could get from that country. We tried to rob them blind, and we put stock in their leaders that allowed us to do it. Um, if, if, if we had worked with the Russian people to build up their country. And by build up, you know, I don't necessarily mean having military bases on their soil the way we did with West Germany, but like really made an effort, then I think that NATO would include Russia or NATO wouldn't exist today. I really do, yeah. There was a time when Russia seemed like it could work, like it could sort of join the broader, you know, like, like maybe not be a part of the West, but at the very least we wouldn't be like militarily tense with each other. But that time is long gone. Um, neoliberalization was at its apex during the early 90s, and we did, like, everything wrong with them. In that respect, by the way, you can, like, lay the blame for all of this, I think, at least partially, on the just neoliberalism as a concept. Um, those attitudes towards world markets and the, um, and, and, like, uh, rapid privatization and austerity and blah blah blah, like, th like this is, this is what killed Russia. And our leaders did fund and enable that process. The parliament massacred a bunch of politicians. He did such a good job that his mate Bill Clinton called him up instantly and congratulated him on his superb handling of the situation. Now, the situation didn't change much for the rest of the 90s. Russia was a poverty stricken wasteland ruled by murderous gangsters. But in 2000, someone new would show up. I mean, he's still a murderous gangster, sure, but, but he was killing for different reasons. He was the anti Boris and he wanted all of Russia to know that he was a tough guy. He doesn't drink, his nipples look like this, and he's here to discipline the oligarchs and bring the Russian government back in control. And people were into it. I mean, like, freakishly into it. <laughs> So you have to ignore the repression and voicing of political opponents, the suppression of independent media, dodgy elections, creeping authoritarianism. But compared to the horrors of the 90s, Putin gave Russians a normal life. Well, normal by, by Russian standards. But at the end of the day, if it wasn't for the US, a dickhead like Putin would have never needed to exist. Uh, nothing, nothing that he's saying here is, is incorrect at all. This isn't, um, this isn't like Putin dick riding or whatever. This is literally like the, the wave that he rode in on. Um... We're not, we're not denying that he's a fascist or whatever, you know, he certainly is. Um, but after, like, your country gets turbo-fucked by uh, austerity and by, like, you know, neoliberals that have sold out to foreign capital, having a nationalist in power is, like, th like you've created the conditions, you know? Um, yeah, this is exactly how fascism takes hold. It's literally 101. Um, you know, an economic crisis exacerbates internal dissident, you know, people feel lost, they lose their sense of identity, they, they, they feel a national humiliation, but wait, a strong man is coming in to purge the country of the, um, the cowards and the, uh, the, the, the foreign, uh, accomplices to, um, to, to get rid of the neoliberals and their inhumane economic practices, you know, to return Russia to its former glory. This is like 101 fascism stuff. I mean, it's like, it, 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 this is, in a materialist sense, what happened to Russia is virtually guaranteed to produce a 
Vladimir Putin. If not him, someone like him. It is, it is almost as reliable a result as the sun rising in the morning. It is just such an incredibly straightforward follow-through. And now that Russia was recovering, Putin was getting a bit antsy that the US would be back with a vengeance. Now, once upon a time, there was like a safety buffer between the two powers, with NATO on one side and the Warsaw Pact on the other. Well, I mean, they also touch over on this side, but that doesn't matter. No one cares about a frozen wasteland like Alaska. Now, when the Warsaw Pact disbanded and Germany joined NATO, the Soviets were assured that NATO wouldn't expand further east. But No. We understand the need for assurances the country of the East. We maintain a present Germany that was part of NATO. There was no extension of the force of the East. At the end of the day, it's acceptable everyone could have a discussion in two plus four context to achieve this kind of outcome. These are transcripts from a meeting. These are not a part of the treaty. Look at the verbiage here. This is a recording of what people said. It doesn't count unless it's in the treaty. I'm sorry that sounds kind of like cringe or whatever, but like when we're talking about international politics, yeah. It does matter that it enters into the treaty. Nobody's gonna, like, spend decades abiding by rules that were set in a backroom meeting on, like, he said, she said, you know, conjecture. You know, they did it anyway, because Russia's completely backwards, and what are they gonna do about it, right? But everyone from prominent foreign... No! We did it anyway because countries asked to join NATO, and, uh, we never made that promise. We never made that official promise. There was a time when um, it was even considered that Russia might eventually join NATO. Um, th th there was a time when this antagonism was latent, in large part because Boris Yeltsin shocked doctrine. Gorbachev himself said this is bullshit. Yeah, like even Gorbachev has acknowledged, though there are people who say there's a political reason he said this, but we know for a fact this was not put in the treaty. Policy experts to senators, military officers, and diplomats, and even the guy who designed America's whole Cold War strategy. They all argued that expanding NATO was a tragic era of historic proportions and that it would start a war in Europe. But you know, that didn't stop them. After years of rampaging around the world, blowing up Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, Libya, Somalia, Yemen, NATO now had their missiles 400 kilometers from the Russian. All right. Yep. Now we're, now we're fully going for it. Nope. Countries. So... Telling the hundreds of millions of people in Central and Eastern Europe that they're just a buffer zone for Russia to eat up um, is not acceptable. Uh, also, not all those engagements were NATO. Wait, what? Wait. That didn't stop them. Tragic era of historical paging around the world, blowing up Yugoslavia, Afghanistan. So hold on. By Yugoslavia, does he mean the NATO intervention that was ten years after the end of the Cold War? Why is he why is he saying after Yugoslavia as though this started happening after Yugoslavia? We so he's just like throwing in random shit here. Libya, Somalia, Yemen. Somal Ye Yemen. D did NATO do we do a, a NATO before What does time mean? Yeah, Yemen wasn't NATO and uh I always rampaging around the world, blowing up Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, Libya, Somalia. Yeah, Libya was when was Libya? Was it twenty um four was it fourteen? Twenty eleven? Yeah, twenty eleven. So okay, yeah. This is a really, really, really stupid part right here. Um just like throwing in random things that have happened. Uh you know, after the fact and saying, like, well then we do. Additionally, if countries want to join NATO, I think they have a right to join NATO. This, we're going to get the same framing here, where it's this, this idea that like we, we conquer a country with NATO membership or something like that. Somalia, Yemen, NATO now had their missiles 400 kilometers from the Russian capital. And watching all this, Putin obviously realized that there are no rules. No. First of all, if countries want to join NATO, they have a right to join NATO. Here, let me pull up the map. Map of NATO countries. Many of the post-Soviet countries that joined NATO did so because they feared invasion from the Soviet Union. So, the first new post-Soviet entry into NATO, the darkest blue. Why do they use such similar colors here? That's really... Uh, 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 yeah. 
Okay. With these three, we have a much larger block in the 20, 2004 to 2009 period. But the first entry wasn't until 1999. Hold on. But Russia fought the first Chechen war back in 1994. The reason countries in the former Soviet sphere started being more interested in joining NATO is because Russia started doing some sussy stuff that they didn't like. The Soviet Union had literally spent the past, like, 70 years um, uh, 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 occupying these countries, suppressing their independence movements, killing their dissidents. Uh, it's not surprising that they would fear, like, a resurgence of conflict. And, um, and Transnistria, and the Second Chechen War, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to get too much into everything because everything is so fractally complicated, but the idea that NATO expanding was just like America trying to get missiles closer to Moscow is not true. It was the lore of the jungle, baby. And no, that's not true. Why would you say there are no rules because countries are willingly joining a military alliance? Because, because what, in one meeting that was never once committed to, uh, to a treaty, they said, oh yeah, we won't expand, but it was never actually included in the treaty, and then other countries willfully decided to join with NATO, and that means there are no rules? I don't understand this. And so, like any great jungle standoff, Putin cried and surrendered and tried to join NATO immediately. I mean, they, they didn't let him join, so Putin... Why is this being framed as crying and surrendering? If Russia had joined NATO, we wouldn't be in this predicament. Do you understand that it's a good thing for nations with shared military turmoil to join the same alliance, therefore discouraging conflict? Like, what is, what is this, a, a dick-waving contest? If the U.S. joined the Warsaw Pact to be seen as weak, right, Vosh? We didn't lose the Cold War. The Soviet Union collapsed. Also, wait, do you care about a country being seen as weak? If the road to peace was America joining the Warsaw Pact because it were some kind of alternate history, then yeah, they should do that. <laughs> if that means peace, yeah. Putin was kind of fucked. But the, the plus side for him was that the average Russian was terrified of NATO expansion. Uh, every time NATO blew up a hospital or a school somewhere, Putin's approval rating went through the roof. What do you mean every time NATO blew up a hospital or a school? If, he, if you're referring to the Yugoslavian intervention, which is where we bombed Serbia because they were doing a genocide, that was years later. This is, yeah, this is, this is essentially like pro-Russian nationalism right here. I, I have no idea why this is being framed this way. Now, across the border in Ukraine and all over Eastern Europe, uh, the 90s were pretty much identical. Uh, everyone got into hard base, they started squatting, and got absolutely ransacked by oligarchs. Uh, but, but the main difference in Ukraine is that they never had a Putin. Ukraine was the land of a hundred Borises. Now, the country was split between Russians in the East and Ukrainians in the West, and all they wanted to do was just punch each other in the head and endlessly swap between either pro-Russian or pro-Western oligarchs. May no, no, no? I don't think Ukraine had some sort of exceptional and ubiquitous disposition for foreign investment. Um, I feel like the implication here that they're trying to make is that, like, what, what's happening here is Russia being right to invade because Ukraine was already completely subservient to Western interests. If that's the direction this is going to go, that's pretty bad. Um, also, Ukraine had a democracy. Russia didn't. They declared independence. I don't know why we're not mentioning that. And they had a democracy. Things were bad there, yeah. But... Okay. Early 2000s, Ukraine wasn't democracy. It was a corrupt hellhole. I don't know what time period we're working in right now, because he keeps jumping. He jumped forward to Libya. I don't know if we just mean immediately post, or what. Making Ukraine the poorest country in Europe. It was an endless cycle. I mean, Yanukovych was a pro-Russian corrupt asshole who hoarded all the country's mansions, luxury cars, and, and microphones, I guess. So they had a revolution to kick him out of power and replace him with the pro-Western Yushchenko. See, now, now we're in 
See, now when are we now? <laughs> who ended up being so corrupt that they kicked him out and went back to Yanukovych, who they kicked out six years earlier. And now but we're here. something weird happened in 2014. No, we're it not at Maidan. Yeah, this again, is Maidan. And pro-European protesters came out in Kiev to try and topple Yanukovych. And like any corrupt oligarchic government, he responded with incredible violence. These people are getting brutalized here. Surely there's someone who's strong and brave enough to defend these weak, squishy pro-European protesters and defend them from the police. Well... Lucky for them, there's another group of pro-Europeans in Ukraine who came to help. In fact, they're so European that they oh, reckon no. that Ukrainians and Europeans are part of some kind of master race. Yeah, yeah. You see, the last time Ukraine was independent was when a big group of Europeans made it their mission to bring civilization and a new order to Eastern Europe. I think they were... What? N no? Wait, when they weren't independent back then. At all. Wait, th wait, this is, this is like, this is complete bullshit. Like, this is just made up. First of all, the Nazis slaughtered the Ukrainians. The idea, why, why are they, po why are we, like, posting, like, Nazi war footage like they were allies? Like, Ukraine was a fucking Axis power. What the hell? Contamination caused the kind of flying of the 20th century. Uh, 19th century saw the rise of Ukrainian nationalism, a bit before the Nazis, that. Uh, Industrial Revolution, Ukraine in 1921. The Ukrainians were split between Austria and Hungary, fighting for the Central Powers. Through the vast majority served in the Imperial Russian Army, which was part of the Triple Entente under the Russia. The Russian Empire collapsed. Conflict followed the Ukrainian War for Independence. Um, so they fought for independence after the collapse of the Russian Empire. Um, cause da, a lot of complicated history stuff, da da da. Seven Polish victory. Polish people annexed the Western Ukrainian provinces. Larger scale victory for the Pol Soviet forces, which succeeded to launch their manufacturers, and eventually established the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. The last time they were independent was a brief period after the fall of the Russian Empire, after which they were immediately gobbled up by the Soviet Union. The Nazis didn't exist yet. That th that th this is completely this is just a lie, flat out. In Poland, the government openly propagated anti-Ukrainian sentiment, restricted rights of people who declared Ukrainian nationality, and belonged to the Eastern Orthodox Church. Da 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 da. We got the Holodomor. Millions of people died there. The Holocaust by bullets in Ukraine. The Holocaust in Ukraine represents the first phase of the Holocaust, in which an estimated 1.5 million Jews were shot to death at close range in ravines, open fields, and forests. Why are we? Why are we pretend like listen again to the framing of this video? Like, does this not sound like he's talking about Ukraine as though it's a fucking Axis power? Kind of master race. Yeah, yeah. You see, the last time Ukraine was independent was when a big group of Europeans made it their mission to bring civilization and a new order to Eastern Europe. I think they were called na na Nazis. N no, they were independent after the Russian Empire fell for all of three seconds. But yes, then Ukraine got invaded by the Nazis. As enemies. They were enemies. And the Nazis killed millions of Ukrainians. Or something. And some Ukrainians were so thankful for their independence that they celebrated by killing hundreds of thousands of Jews, Poles, Gypsies, and Russians. And then the Europeans said bye bye and continued their journey eastwards through Russia. What the fuck is this framing, dude? Would, would anyone say this about, like, Poland or France? like, created Nazis in Poland or France, they were invaded by the Nazis, and the Nazis, yes, worked with sympathetic locals, which happens any time the Nazis occupied any place, because any place, if push comes to shove, is going to have people who will work with their occupiers. This is a fact of history, no matter the ideology of the people involved. Uh, uh, but, but, like, so... If the actual statement being made here is that Nazis invaded Ukraine, and as a product, there are, there are ideological descendants of the Nazis in Ukraine, because there were people who worked with the regime and Nazi soldiers who stayed there afterwards, and there have always been far-right people in Ukraine, which is the case in every country everywhere, who just were emboldened by the presence of the Nazis, that would be the case. But I, I don't know why he's lying about the independence movement or the, uh, the, the time during which they were independent or framing it as though they were a national ally of the Nazis. I think he's trying to frame this as a free state. The Reichskommissariat Ukraine was a civilian occupation regime. Much of Nazi German occupied Ukraine. Yeah, but did this not happen 
in most every country that was occupied by Nazis. Like, if we went through all the countries that were occupied by the Nazis, they also would have formed local... Like, yeah, that's what you do when you occupy... Is this the... Is this independent Ukraine? Is he framing this as independent Ukraine? Well, the last time they were independent was when they were conquered by the Nazis. Okay. Uh, where they killed another 26 million Russians. Anyway, they're all celebrated by killing hundreds of thousands of Jews, Poles, Gypsies, and Russians. And then the Europeans said bye-bye and continued their journey eastwards through Russia where they killed another 26 million Russians. Anyway, they're- It's just so weird to me that he's framing the Holocaust in Ukraine as done by Ukrainians against their own rather than by the occupying Nazi regime. That, like, I've never heard somebody phrase it like that before. The Nazis invaded, and then Ukrainians killed one and a half million of their own. I've never heard somebody phrase it like that before. That's like borderline Holocaust denialism right there. Like, obviously, occupational governments are going to pull people from the local territory, but that, it's the Nazi occupation. They, it's the Nazis. Like, yeah. Collaborationism is a fact of the world. It's just unfor it's, it's just something that happens. There are a lot of tough boys in 2014 that were very proud of this history. I think they were called like neo nazis or something. And while the regular pro-democracy protesters were squeamish and unprepared to fight, these boys had been training for this their whole lives. And things went from zero to 100 real quick. Kiev became a war zone. No. The escalation took place because of um, Yanukovych. That's the name of the guy, right? It's really difficult for me to keep in mind all of these, all of these names. The, yeah, Yanukovych, the guy who got ousted. Um, he was the one who escalated tensions against the protesters, and Putin himself, incur who, because Yanukovych was a puppet of Putin, Yanukovych um, uh, 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 escalated tensions at the request of Putin to try to crack down on the pro-democracy protesters. The far-right nationalist Ukrainians were always a presence in um, the protest movements, but there's no reason to believe they were a colossal pre um, presence, like, at all. There's just no reason to believe that. Um, no evidence that I've seen has indicated that. Like, I keep seeing these articles about, like, far-right at the Euromaidan protests, and it's like, yeah, they were there. A lot of people were there. Like, does Ukraine have a far-right nationalist movement? Yeah. Find me a country in Eastern Europe that doesn't. Like, yeah, we, we understand this about ISIS, don't we? We understand this about um, Hamas. If a country is occupied and terrorized by war, they are going to have far-right militancy movements. That happens everywhere. There's nothing unique about Ukraine's far-right movement. Often, far-right nationalism in Ukraine is associated with the Nazis because the Nazis were the most recent group, prior to the fall of the Soviet Union, to fight against Soviet occupation. So when people dislike Soviet or post-Soviet Russian occupation, the Nazis are an icon, like the Bandera, you know, who collaborated with the Nazis because he hated the Soviets so fucking much. Um, but this isn't a product of some, like, uniquely Nazi movement. This is very simple socioeconomics. Uh, ubiquitous in the region, but for some reason people keep hyper-fixating on in a bad-faith effort to pose Ukraine as some kind of uniquely Nazi-like country. You know, coups and revolutions aren't just about horrible violence. Sometimes they're about the friends you make along the way. Friends like Vitaly Klitschko. He was one of the original protest leaders, a professional boxer and professional twin. He tried to calm down these new violent radicals, but they KO'd him in one round. He was now being eclipsed by a new string of leaders. Leaders like Oleg Tyakhnibok. Now this is a guy who liked to rant about exterminating Jews and Russians, and he barely even finished a Zieg Heil with his right hand before John McCain swooped in and shook it. American politicians were now swarming all over Ukraine, ready to fund and support the invigorated far right, which was about to overwhelm the government and force Inukovic to flee the country. No. The far right was not the force that prompted the ousting of Yanukovych, the broader protesting in Euromaidan. You can see videos of the protests. It's not like it's like 20 Nazi dudes or whatever. The government, or the, the, the Yanukovych was insanely corrupt and the people of Ukraine ousted him because he'd gone against the will of the people and had an exclusive economic deal um, uh, with Russia put forward. Uh, the idea that this was just like them running the show is just not the case. It was a popular uprising.
Um, additionally, uh, the West did not swoop in to assist the far right. I still haven't seen ev any evidence with that. I mean, does America have far right politicians who get a along with far right leaders in other countries? Absolutely. But I don't think there's any reason to believe that the West, like, uniquely backed. The West wouldn't even necessarily want to back the far right here because the far right here were nationalists. Um, uh, uh, the far, the Americans want to work with the kinds of people who will get along with us. And most of the far right in Ukraine backed Putin and vice versa because Putin is a fascist and Yanukovych was a fascist sympathizer. And the government under Yanukovych and the people more aligned with Russia were more ideologically far right than the, op than the opponents to that regime. Now the EU started freaking out. They saw the pro-democracy liberals were losing control to the neo-Nazis and- No, literally just factually incorrect. Not even remotely true. As we're going to see from the election results following the Euromaidan protests, at no point was the far right even remotely close to controlling the narrative um, or, or controlling like the, the, the political movement in Euromaidan. It's completely dishonest, like 100%. And they pushed for a compromise that would leave Yanukovych in power, but it was too late. Now, the Americans were in charge, and they said, fuck the EU, we're gonna back the Nazis. Again, literally not just true at all. The United States and Europe broadly were in favor of the Euromaidan protests. They did not swoop in there to, like, specifically try to push the, the, the Nazis into power. And I know that because if there was evidence of that, I already would have seen it in the 58 debates I've had with people like this. That's literally what they said. Show me. Fuck the EU. See, now this is a leaked phone call between the US Assistant Secretary- Oh God, this phone call, okay. Secretary of State and the US Ambassador to Ukraine. And they're planning out who they should put in charge of the new Ukrainian government. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. Yeah, no, I think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. Now, this phone call was bad news for poor old Klitschko, you know. You might notice nowhere in the recording provided did it indicate they were choosing who to put in power, only who they liked. All they just showed from that phone call was them going like, oh, I think this guy knows this. It's just an opinion sharing. It's, this is one of those tanky propaganda pieces. It's like a, it's like a leaked phone call where you have two government officials who are talking about a, a current issue and they sound like they, you know, they know some stuff and people just fucking rolled with it. And they were like, oh, they know something about a thing that's happening. They, they have opinions on a thing that is part of their job. They must be like literally, they must be like smoking a cigarette and like aiming the scopes up to like shoot the next leader to determine who gets in charge, you know? Um... Also, that Yats guy was a generic neo-lib. They're literally just talking about, like, who would be in charge next. First he gets beaten up, then the Americans don't even let him in the government. So, uh, I don't think Cleet should go, should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. And what do you know? Everyone they decided on in that phone call ended up magically being in charge of Ukraine. Wow. Well, the person who took over Ukraine afterwards was literally the opposition leader and the only person who had any credible right to be interim leader. That's, yeah, the, the person who followed up after the, the, the removal of Yanukovych was just the opposition leader, and then he, there was an, an election that took place several months after, and he just stepped down to, you know. With neo-Nazis holding numerous government positions. Uh-huh. Neo-Nazis did hold a few government positions, until... The election came around just a few months afterwards, where the far right was fucking decimated. By the way, if we're counting by fascists, having three people in, like, broader government positions, America has fascists everywhere. We're, we're trying to frame this like this is some kind of key Nazi takeover, because Secretary of Defense, Prosecutor General, and Deputy Prime Minister were far right guys for the few months we had an interim government before there was another set of elections. And, hey, who'd have thunk it? The left-leaning side won. And the new government didn't waste any time. They got rid of Russian as an official language, started resurrecting all the old Nazi symbols and praising- What the fuck? Hold on. Uh, this guy, this, this, this guy getting, getting paid for this shit? Jesus Christ. The Ukrainian parliament, when they had their proper election, is just... 
the far right just does not have a, a presence here. Um, the um, so okay, yeah. I, there's so much misinfo here. First of all, last wish is correct. The language bill was exclusively that service workers and teachers were required to greet people in Ukrainian. People could still spe uh, choose to speak Russian if they wanted. After the Russian puppet Yanukovych got ousted, there was a uh, an effort to de-Russify the country because they were still being um, controlled effectively by Russia in a number of ways. And one of this was through a revitalization of Ukrainian nationalism. But that nationalism did not take a far-right character. It was an anti-Russian character. A lot of this is compounded by the fact that, I don't know if he's gonna bring this up, but Russia is about to fucking annex Crimea. So, when did that language bill get passed? Ukraine language law. 2019? Oh, hello, Lonerbox. Well, Crimea got annexed in 2014. So, the, the idea, like, the framing in this video is so fucking dishonest. Um, there are a lot of Ukrainian nationalist uh, icons and symbols that are associated with the Bandera Nazi Alliance fascist um, uh, uh, type deal. But, like, to be fair, Germany still uses the Iron Cross in its, um, uh, um, in a, in a number of its, um, uh, uh, symbols, even though it had, it was like used during the Nazi time and has associations with that regime. You know, if a country has a history of Nazi control and occupation, there are going to be parts of its iconography and its culture that are wrapped up in that history. But if you're going to make the argument that Ukraine is like Nazified, then how, then how do you reconcile that with the fact that the far right got bodied in the 2014 election? Like, how do you reconcile that with the fact that Zelensky is like, like Ukraine is the first country to have a Jewish um, prime minister and president, that their country is uniquely anti-Semitic in the region. The fact that, um, uh, uh, like, like, how do you, how do you reconcile all that? Yes, Lonerbox has a video on the language law. This is massively overstated. Um, sorry, uniquely not anti-Semitic. Uniquely anti-anti-Semitic. I misspoke. Ukraine's World War II fascist government. Now, if you want to scare the thing, all the old Nazi symbols and praising Ukraine's World War II fascist government. I'm sorry, when the fuck did the post Yanukovych Ukrainian government start praising Bandera's government? Is there like an official law that we're referring to here? I mean, I see a guy doing a Sikh Heil. You can find people doing this in like any country on earth. What, what is the argument being made here? Now, if you want to scare the shit out of an ethnic minority, this is how you do it, right? All over Russian-speaking Eastern Ukraine, people went wild. It turns out they were scared of Nazis and they wanted out of Ukraine. Holy shit! They weren't scared of Nazis. They were more politically associated with Russia, which was to their east. And because Russian influence had just been expelled from the country in the form of Euromaidan pushing Yanukovych out, they were concerned that that would lead to a disempowerment of the political forces that they were more in line with. That, that, that's it. No, th this is, I, I didn't realize the video would be this bad. This is insanely bad. This is worse than a lot of Jimmy Dore videos. And they were ready to fight for it. So Putin obviously jumped on this immediately. He was no, he didn't. He created the set. He he didn't. Them fighting for it was him engaging in a proxy war in East Ukraine in the Donbass. He annexed Crimea. He was ready to break some rules, American style. He blatantly annexed Crimea, but he had different plans for the East country. He pumped them full of Russian weapons and training. Okay. They got guns and tanks and, and, and guns for their tanks and gu guns for their guns, plunging Ukraine into an unwinnable civil war. Putin wanted to keep this war going until the new government collapsed. But now okay. was the time for the neo-Nazis to shine even brighter. The new government was desperate to subdue the Russian-backed separatists, and no one is willing to kill and die more than fundamentalist radical neo-Nazis. It's obviously a bit weird. What? What? The, they, they were fighting a civil war. What do we... ...to focus on neo-Nazis in Ukraine, because every country has neo-Nazis, right? We've got neo-Nazis here in Australia. And just like in Ukraine, they're a tiny fringe minority. 
But in Australia, we at least like to pretend that there aren't any neo-Nazis in our armed forces. But Ukraine is the only country in the world that openly has full-blown neo-Nazi formations in its military. Like Azov Battalion, for example, whose leader, Andriy Bulecki, is known for saying all this cute stuff like, it's Ukraine's mission to lead the white races of the world in a final crusade against the Semite-led inferior races. So first of all, no. Uh, there are other governments that have military detachments that are directly associated with, or themselves, Nazis, like the Wagner Group from Russia. Secondly, they were not a military detachment. The Azov Battalion was a militia that was formed in uh, East Ukraine as a result of the constant fighting that was being brought about by Russian-backed separatist forces. Russia, or sorry, Ukraine was so broke, they were so fucking poor, that they started deputizing local militia groups as a way of, of trying to get the, the separatists out. Now, you can argue that's bad, but functionally, Ukraine was getting invaded. They already had far-right militia groups and they were like you know what fuck it sure go forth yeah go go keep this country from being invaded by russia you can argue the logistics on that i will say however that i would have done the exact same thing if my country was being bullied and invaded by a massively militarily superior one and i had nazis around who are willing to go die and coincidentally keep my country safe yeah i would th go throw them at the conflict i am perfectly okay with having Nazis thrown into conflict. I think that's wonderful, because two things can happen. Russians can die, or Nazis can die. In either case, fine. If I'm going to have, you know, Nazis in my country, I would rather have them be thrown into the meat grinder than affecting local politics. Now, he rounds up a bunch of Nazi football hooligans and arms them using oligarch money, and then his battalion, along with many others, is formally in using oligarch money it it's it's a he's a he's a government official it's the government it's government money yeah what is this framing it's the gut he that they raise it via taxes what do, you, what do you mean are we gonna mention Zelensky being jewish incorporated into the Ukrainian army. I mean, that, that's like instead of sending the Marines to fight in Afghanistan, you send the KKK. Except in Afghanistan, we invaded another country on the opposite side of the world. In this case, their country was being invaded and the Nazi militia group already existed. So it's actually not even remotely comparable. However, if the glorious United States of America was in fact invaded by those despotic Chinese hordes, and our country was being slaughtered and overtaken, and a bunch of KKK-esque militia types wanted to fight anyway? Godspeed. Go die. Or kill. I don't care which. Yeah, wait, is this an option? Can we go send the Ku Klux Klan to go die in the front lines? I didn't know that was an option. That's awesome. These guys were sent east to go fight the separatists, and the U.S. loved it. They were trained. By the way, you should note the reason why this guy is using a carefully cultivated selection of images and videos to explain the Azov Battalion, rather than any kind of numbers, is because there have never been that many of them, like at all. Um, you know, the the way he's he's leaving it ambiguous because you know you he wants you to think like. Oh yeah, well, a third of Ukraine's military is actually an official Nazi brigade. There have been, depending on the time and definition, because there were also non-Nazis in the Azov Battalion, once they got deputized as part of the, you know, uh, regional defense force, you know, if other people get roped in, they're not all part of the divisions that are openly Nazi aligned. But depending on who you ask and when you ask, it can be like 600 to a few thousand people. Uh, right now, Ukraine has hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Uh, at the time that uh, Crimea was annexed, they had far, far, far fewer. Most of their military might was concentrated um, in those uh, fucking militia groups that hated the Russians so much. Uh, you know. Al Jazeera estimates the number of explicit Nazis in Azov to be around 900. 900? Guys, this is like a fraction of the people who showed up to fucking January 6th. Like, 
if you had a QAnon convention, and there have been QAnon conventions, you'll get more people than this. The idea that, like, Ukraine has bent the knee to the Nazi regime when it ousted the entire far right from its government is led by a Jew, um, and it, it's, it's just got this little, like, incorporated militia that it threw at Mariupol and has probably been cut in half by this point. Like, um, just, it's such, it's, it's such dishonest framing. Yeah, guys, for comparison's sake, there are more than 6,000 people in this live stream. So, if we took, like, one-seventh of the people watching, um, of the viewers of this live stream, th congratulations, you know? Go to a, go to a D live stream with 900 viewers, and you have now found what this YouTuber is using to paint all of Ukraine as a Nazi-bent country. Them, sending them crazy amounts of money and weapons. And just like when the US trained and funded far-right extremists to fight the Russians in the 80s and turned Afghanistan into a mecca for global jihadis, the Ukraine war became the hip place to be for the global far-right looking for military experience to use to terrorize people back home. But that's more or less a... Neo-Nazi terror group, the base linked to war in Ukraine, fighting Russia in Ukraine, sadly appears to... Racist, far-right extremists. Wait, what are these articles even saying? For global jihadis, the Ukraine war became... ...the Russians in the 80s and turned Afghanistan into a mecca for global jihadis. The Ukraine war... The Nazis are exploiting Russia's Ukraine for their own purposes. Not since ISIS have we seen a flurry of recruitment activity. What are the specific claims being made here? The war became the hit place to be for the global far... Neo-Nazi terror. The funny thing is, is that internationally, far-right people around the world side with Russia in this conflict, so. Neo-Nazi terror group, the base link to the war in Ukraine. 20-year-old American went from inside Neo-Nazi's group's secret chat room to traveling to Ukraine to look for war. Good. Wait, so they die fighting Russians? What is the issue here? A lot of the far-right people come from Russia, too. Extremists fight on both sides. Note how he's using articles from 2014 as well. It's so hard to see because he has the transparency and contrast set so high. Yeah, it doesn't even specify whether, like, which side of the conflict they're on. Like, there have been no far-right extremists who fight in favor of Russia. All right, looking for military experience to use to terrorize people back home. But that's more or less irrelevant. The real victims here are the people of Ukraine. They're caught in a bloodthirsty tug of war between the U.S. and Russia. With no, they're not, because the United States isn't tugging. All you've described here is their territory being annexed by Russia and then Russia funding a civil war in their territory. What the fuck are we doing? Tens of thousands of people dying and terrorized into fleeing their homes. By Russia from invading. Russia's invasion. Yeah, that is what is producing the people dying and fleeing their homes. People weren't dying and fleeing their homes and then Russia invaded and now they are. Then, a miracle happened. A comedian called Volodymyr Zelensky stars in a sitcom about a high school teacher fed up with corruption who unexpectedly becomes president of Ukraine. And then the, the comedian playing the president of Ukraine unexpectedly becomes president of Ukraine. Yeah, Zelensky, a Jewish man, the peace candidate hey. promising to end the war, won with a landslide 73%, while the far right got smashed with only 2%. Sucked shit. Everyone from east to west was cheering for the new guy. The Nazis were pissed, you know, once upon a time. Okay. Time, they were untouchable, right? And now when the far right battalions refused to do a ceasefire, suddenly there was this Jewish dude, the president, on the front lines, getting up in their grill. <laughs> Now, if there's one thing Nazis hate, it's Jews taking away their weapons. But, unfortunately, as hard as Zelensky tried, they just break the ceasefires anyway. He was never in full control of his own country. He... No, no, no. The Russians broke the... Oh, no, the Russians continuously broke the ceasefires. Russia did that. What, what the fuck is this framing, dude? Uh, the Jewish president couldn't control his Nazi military, so they kept breaking the agreement? Minsk 1 and 2 were both broke by Russia. They, Russia never, at any point, committed to a ceasefire. They were flagrantly dishonest at every single point. 
they, they like no effort was made at all. P Putin lied. The Americans and the Russians were, and they didn't give a shit. They were just using Ukraine to fight each other. No, they weren't. America hadn't done anything. We weren't fighting Russia. We, we, we sanctioned Russia after the Crimea incident, you know. We, we weren't fighting them. This wasn't a proxy war. Everything, it's the fucking leftists with their American exceptionalism. Not everything is a proxy war with America. Sometimes things are just the fault of other countries. If you really want to frame it like, well, actually, every conflict ever is a proxy war with America because we represent global capital, then proxy war doesn't have any meaning. Then, then it doesn't mean anything. Like, it's a proxy war because on one hand, you have Russia invading and annexing territory, and on the other hand, America, like, doesn't want them to? What? We, okay? The United States aids Ukraine and her people so that we can fight Russia over there and we don't have to fight Russia here. I mean, they were also using Ukraine to make a lots and lots of money for their buddies. Hold on. Real quick. The United States aids Ukraine and her people so that we can fight Russia over there and we don't have to fight Russia here. What aid is he referring to? And additionally, just because this is said, for one, no context this clip. Second of all, this doesn't imply a proxy war. If Russia is an invading force, Ukraine holding the line prevents war with Russia, even if it's not a proxy war. I mean, they were also using Ukraine to make a lots and lots of money for their buddies. I mean, like, like, like Hunter Biden, right? He's Biden's son and he's also America's best looking crack addict, you know, with absolutely zero experience. He was given a million dollars a year to sit on the board of a Ukrainian gas company. And when Ukraine's top prosecutor started investigating the company for corruption, Biden withheld US aid until they fired the prosecutor. Okay. Is, wait, is this guy a conservative? What, what channel am I looking at right now? Oh god, these are such old memes, dude. Um, I don't remember all the talking points around this. This is literally like a far-right conspiracy. I heard about this from Tim Pool. Um, no. The, guy, the, the investigator who got ousted was, was, was condemned and sanctioned by, like, everyone in the EU. He was hated for being an enormously corrupt um, uh, uh, in investigator. Um, the prosecutor that literally refused to investigate the company. Yeah, um, that clip was from Trump's impeachment, was it? I don't know why you just linked me an infinity-length document. Um, Suddenly went from Tanky to Glenn Greenwald. Yeah, hold on. Ah, the Biden-Ukraine conspiracy theory. It has its own Wikipedia page. It's a series of unconfirmed claims centered on the false allegation that while Biden was vice president of the United States, he engaged in corrupt activities relating to the employment of his son, Hunter Biden. They were spread primarily in an attempt to damage Joe Biden's reputation during the 2020 presidential campaign. Seriously? U.S. intel analysis released in 2021 found the proxy of Russian intelligence promoted laundry misleading or unsubstantial narratives about Biden, literally like repeating Russian misinfo. U.S. media organizations, U.S. officials, and prominent U.S. individuals, including some close to former President Trump and his administration. Um, the New York Times reported in May 2021 that a federal criminal investigation was examining a possible role by current and former Ukrainian officials, including whether they used former Trump Rudy Giuliani, who's the subject of a separate federal investigation to spread unsubstantiated claims. The conspiracy theory alleges then-VP Biden withheld loan guarantees to pressure Ukraine into firing a prosecutor that prevent, to prevent a corruption investigation into Burisma and to protect his son. The U.S. did withhold aid to pressure Ukraine into removing the prosecutor in accord with the official and bipartisan policy of the federal government of the United States. The U.S. government, along with the EU, World Bank, and IMF, believe the prosecutor to be corrupt and inefficient and too lenient in investigating companies and oligarchs, including Burisma and its owner. A 2018 video showed Biden taking credit for withholding the loan guarantees to have the prosecutor fired, acting to implement bipartisan U.S. policy rather than for the reason the conspiracy theory alleges. So it's literally just everyone put pressure on having this guy fired because he was corrupt and wouldn't look into corrupt companies. Um, but that's it. Yeah, you can literally, you can, that's the guy that was shown the video. I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> got fired. Trump did exactly the same thing.
I can't believe the Vice President of the United States also got the World Bank and the IMF and the European Union and the United States federal government to all put pressure on a guy who was already corrupt in a, in a context that did not even lead to the exoneration of his son. You know, everyone was just taking turns, just milking Ukraine, just milking it good. Oof. What the fuck is this? Ooh. Why? Ooh. Why? Ooh. Um, anyway, Zelensky's approval rating was, was plummeting, right? And he realized if you can't stop the war, you've got to join the war, right? And he got oh, his opportunity no. as soon as Biden was elected president. Oh, Suddenly, no. Suddenly, Zelensky did a complete backflip. He went full Putin. He arrested the head of the opposition who had just overtaken him in the polls. He shut down opposition TV channels and most importantly, began talks for NATO membership. Now, Putin was absolutely furious. You what is the timeline on these things? Didn't the arrest of the op opposition leader happen after something else happened? From Tanky to QAnon? Yeah, hold on. Hold on. Court in Ukraine declines request to arrest former president. Uh, feud between Petro Ol... Poroshenko. This guy. On the 20th of December, Poroshenko was accused of state treason, aiding terrorist organizations, and financing terrorism due to an allegedly organized the purchase of coal from separatist-controlled areas of Ukraine, along with pro-Russian politician Viktor Medvyshuk. If convicted, he faced up to 15 years in prison. Poroshenko denied the allegations, called them fabricated and politically motivated. Um, on the 6th of January, a Ukrainian court seized Poroshenko's property. On the 15th of January, Poroshenko announced a, via a video message on Facebook, I am returning to Ukraine on a flight from Warsaw to defend Ukraine from Russian aggression, despite the case against him. Following his return to Ukraine, the prosecutor's office asked the court to either reprimand uh, uh, him in pretrial detention for two months or oblige him to pay a bill of 37 million USD or an electronic basement, remain in Kiev and hand over his passport. The court chose a third option, personal commitment, which is less strict than house arrest and doesn't involve playing bail. According to this commitment, Poroshenko has submitted his passport to the authorities, not leave Kiev or the Kiev Oblast without first receiving permission to inform the authorities of his place of employment or residence change. So, he was arrested on charges. Is that who we're referring to? Or are we referring to this arrest of a, um, of, of a, um, an opponent, Viktor Medvyshuk, who is a, um, Ukrainian lawyer, business oligarch, and politician, People's Deputy of Ukraine 2019. He served as the chairman of the pro-Russian po uh, political organization Ukrainian Choice. He is an opponent of Ukraine joining the EU. And what was he charged with? Terrorism criminal case. Financing of terrorism. Oh, this is the same guy. This is... So it was these two. So this guy was arrested on suspicion of terrorism uh, through selling resources obtained in the contested area of the, um, of the, uh, uh, Donbass region. And this guy later got implemented in the same, in the same situation later. Okay. I mean, that's a far cry from Zelensky had them arrested. I mean, Zelensky had them arrested kind of makes him sound like Putin. Like he can unilaterally do that as opposed to him being the president in a democracy. From the article, Medvyshuk is also charged with allegedly disclosing secret data on the deployment of Ukrainian military units last year. Damn, that sounds like a pretty legitimate charge. And most importantly, began talks for NATO membership. Now, Putin was absolutely furious. He used Sorry, he mentioned one other thing I hear that I think is wrong. He arrested the head of the opposition who had just overtaken him in the polls. He shut down opposition TV channels. And most importantly, so again, he arrested the head of the opposition who had just overtaken him in the polls. He no mention of why, no, no saying that it was an investigation being done, just he unilaterally, and it must have been because of the polls. Like, this is being framed as a propagandist would, right here. This is, um, this is just flagrant dishonesty. Uh, the information is being presented in half-truths. Uh, with, with information deliberately omitted to present a specific narrative. This is being done deliberately. This is not just a mistake. This is crafted. He shut down opposition TV channels and most importantly began talks for NATO membership. Ukraine has been vying for NATO membership for decades. It was not just under Zelensky. 
The opposition TV channels were spouting literal pro-Russian propaganda, that's why they were banned. Yeah, considering the fact that Russia was in the process of funding a civil war in their country, the idea of, like, shooting down media that was just being meant to propagandize for the opposition seems reasonable. Imagine, like, imagine being in France in, like, 19-fucking-39. Imagine, like, Nazi Germany invading, and there are Nazi sympathizers in your country broadcasting Nazi propaganda, and the French government shuts it down, and people are like, how could you do that? That's so authoritarian of you. Yeah, they started looking to NATO membership the year after they declared independence. Now, Putin was absolutely furious. It used to just be because Putin was shit at piano. While Zelensky could do this. Fair. Now, Putin's dick was obviously too small to play piano, so to compensate, Russia starts building up troops on the border and sends out a draft treaty. It's said that Ukraine needs to have guaranteed neutrality and that NATO removes its missiles and battle groups from Eastern Europe and Zelensky never plays piano ever again. Now, this standoff lasted for about a year and the US spent that year doing what you'd imagine someone would do if they wanted Russia to invade Ukraine. First off, they refused to negotiate. There are some... Why would we... Oh my god. Why would... First of all, no, we don't want them to invade Ukraine. Second of all, we're not going to negotiate with... Russia wanted NATO to retreat back to its post-Cold War borders. We're not going to negotiate with a country that's mid-invasion of Ukraine saying, okay, well, we'll belong... We'll, we'll get along now. You just have to renege on your military treaties with, like, 13 countries. What? What? I think he's talking about the whole not letting them in NATO thing. Why would we let Russia decide for us which countries are allowed to be in our military alliances? Doesn't the, the whole reason NATO exists is because Russia is a military threat. Why would we let the enemy of NATO decide for us which countries should be allowed to apply for NATO? That is insane. We didn't let Ukraine into NATO because it's the policy of NATO to not let countries in when they're undergoing internal conflict. And there are other categories they have to meet as well. But since 2014, Russia has been funding an internal conflict, preventing them from joining NATO. We can't let them into NATO until that's addressed. Very obvious non-starters and things that the uh, Russians have put on the table. But Simon- Your military alliance not a proxy war though? No! It's not a proxy war! to let countries that are threatened by their neighbors into a military alliance. That's not the definition of a proxy war. A proxy war is when two countries are fighting through another country. Like, they're both committing to that. That, like, one side funds one group of rebels and the other side funds the government. That's not the case. Ukraine is an autonomous agent. It's not a proxy war if you're just an ally with the country that's being invaded. That's not what proxy war means. And if that's the case, like, we're, we aren't, like, it's not America and Russia are deciding the fate of Ukraine. It's Russia invading Ukraine, the sovereign country with whom we are allies. If that's the case, if that meets the definition of a proxy war, every country fighting every other country is a proxy war. Because all countries have allies who will want their allies to succeed in military conflicts. You might as well say that, like, in the invasion of Poland was a proxy war between um, England and Germany because England didn't want Germany to invade Poland. Like, what does proxy war even mean then if it includes just being allies with a country that's under attack? Simultaneously, the US kept reminding Russia that if they did invade, the US wouldn't do anything about it. Well, I will not yeah, obviously we're not going to commit to sending troops to fight with a nuclear power over a country that's not in NATO. Yeah, obviously. Why would, would you want us to? Would you want America to be like, yeah, Ukraine isn't in our military alliance, but we're still willing to threaten to end the world over direct conflict over it? Why would we do that? not send American servicemen to fight in Ukraine. So it became this game of chicken where both sides are flying at each other and Ukraine is just stuck. In We're not flying! We're, you're not even describing the United States doing anything! The, it, what, in what way are we flying? You're showing clips of American politicians saying, yeah, we're not going to do anything. How is that flying? What does that mean? What, in what way? <laughs> what does that mean? In the middle. 
and then Russia proved to be the bigger maniac and actually invaded their neighbor. So what, wait, so what was, if we had, if we had won the game of chicken, would we have invaded Ukraine? What is the implication here? Also, how exactly were we encouraging them to invade Ukraine when, and here's something that he's conveniently left out of the video. Guys, approximately how many times did Biden threaten sanctions on Russia if they invaded? Can you count on one hand? Can you count on two hands? No, you can't, because it happened a lot. But we're not going to mention that because we're trying to promote the narrative that um, that America actually wanted Russia to invade for some reason, despite it only being bad for us. It certainly is not just a proxy war. This is Russia's fault, but it's also but it is a proxy war between Russia and the West. You can't deny that. Yeah, I can. A proxy war is not there is a country you hope doesn't lose to an enemy. That's not what a proxy war is. Again, if that's the case, then uh, the term proxy war would encompass virtually all conflicts between all countries because almost every country has allies that will wish for their success against other countries. A proxy war is an armed conflict between two states or non-state actors, one or both of which at the instigation or on behalf of other parties that are not directly involved. So it's not one. America did not instigate the conflict, and Ukraine isn't fighting on our behalf. They're fighting for their own sake. Um, it's, it's not like the Ukrainian military is some kind of like de facto American militia group that's fighting to protect our business interests. It's its own country. It does not meet the definition of a proxy war. Is Russia and America fighting a proxy war in Syria? Yes. Yeah, th that would be a much, much, much cleaner example. In large part because Russia like supports Syria as a direct counter of American, um, of American interests. Uh, people argue that Rojava would count on our side, but I don't really think that it is because they're not fighting on our behalf. Um, but there are groups there that kind of sort of it's yeah no that's that's way more so. Um, Russia fits the criteria there, though. Vietnam is an example, yes, um, 100%. You could argue that the invasion of the Donbass in 2014 was a proxy war. In fact, it was, because in that case, the Russian separatists were a separate entity fighting on behalf of Russia. But now that it's direct conflict between Ukraine and Russia, they're both fighting for their own interests here. With Russians smashing Ukraine, millions of people fleeing and thousands of civilians dying, a furious Zelensky comes out and reveals that the West was never even going to let him into NATO anyway. But The West has been denying Ukraine entrance into NATO for 30 years. This was not new information. That wasn't, this wasn't a twist that was always known. NATO has a very specific policy on not allowing nations entrance if they're undergoing a civil conflict. They are. This isn't news. This is... Dude, I want to talk to this fucking guy. I didn't realize the video would be this bad. When I got the email telling me to go over this video, I thought it would just be like your standard dumb fuck lefty NATO aggression posturing, not this like b borderline RT propaganda shit. But they made him pretend that he was going to. What? Wait, what? What? And the response was very clear. You are not going to be a NATO or EU member, but publicly, the doors will remain open. The whole thing. Yeah. Th what? That's been our open policy for decades. The door remains open, but you're not going to be a NATO member because you have an internal conflict. That's not like, like that's we've been saying this for decades. That is not new. That's been our line for decades. Thing was a setup and Zelensky got used. It was not a setup. This has been the kid. Zelensky was 12 when we first announced this. The open door policy on Ukraine's entrance into NATO, but you can't join yet, has been the case since you since Zelensky wasn't old enough to drink. This is not new. In the bloody tug of war between East and West. Uh. And now thousands of Ukrainians and Russians are dying. And there's, a, there's a brand new war in Europe. If only there was someone who could have, someone who could have predicted this, someone with the power to stop it. I, I mean, Putin could have not invaded. Uh, th that, yeah, maybe. And if there was ever anything that was going to tip the balance. And here we go. Now we're bringing it back around to being America's fault. Balance were to be tipped. 
in terms of this is this really is expertly um uh, uh produced propaganda it is objectively empirically dishonest it is uh willfully negligent with the misinfo it, it it omits inconvenient information it puts everything together in a nice little video like audio video package that's easy to digest but doesn't really like invite much scrutiny because it never gives specifics this is just like propaganda yeah a vigorous and hostile reaction in russia it would be that guys is it possible that in over the course of 25 years people's positions on geopolitical issues might change flagrant hypocrisy abound biden w once said a thing but now he's saying a different thing and it's only been a quarter of a century do, do we have a five second clip from back when VHS tapes were the most advanced technology on the planet. Uh, therefore... What, you're not even going to suggest anything? If, um, Ukraine isn't in NATO, even if NATO had never moved eastward, in all likelihood, Russia would have invaded Ukraine way earlier than they did now. Russia has been trying to exert control over Ukraine for a long time. That was the, the whole Euromaidan thing. The um, Yanukovych, the guy they ousted, was a stooge to Putin. And he had been present in politics for years beforehand. Russia was trying to control Ukraine through, like, a political stooge. And when the country ousted him, he immediately responded by conquering Crimea and instigating a civil war in, in the East. There was no timeline where Putin would have allowed Ukraine to live and let live. Everything that's happened over the past decade and a half has been a clear indicator that they would never have accepted truly independent Ukraine. Oh, that was a good video. Nah, it wasn't. Also, stop picking your nose. This is a very bad video. See, this guy gets it. To be fair, the image of sending the Ku Klux Klan to Afghanistan, not with any actual armaments, just sending them to be slaughtered by the thousands by the Taliban is pretty hilarious. That's what I'm saying! Yeah. When w during the siege of Mariupol, where it was fucking Chechen Nazis on one side and Ukrainian Nazis on the other, there's literally no bad outcome, dude. Every casualty is cause for celebration. It's great.